Welcome to this virtual tour of St. Anne's Church in Washington, D.C. for Tenley Towns Winterfest. We're glad you're able to join us. So uh, my name is Sal Silvaggio. I'm a parishioner here at St. Anne's Church. And uh, what we thought we'd do is introduce people uh, of Tenley Town and the other areas around uh, to St. Anne's Church because you may not know much about it or you may pass it by in your car and see it and not know too much. And actually, um, our parish here is a very integral part of the history of Tenley Town. So what I'd like to do today is to uh, talk about uh, a few things involving uh, our church, including the architecture of our church, our beautiful stained glass windows, and how St. Anne's is integrated into the community of Tenley Town. So first, uh, let's talk about our architecture. Good. So then, so then um, okay, just to give you an idea what it looks like inside, Here's a, an image of looking towards the back of our church, which faces Wisconsin Avenue. You can get a, uh, a look at some of our beautiful stained glass windows, which we'll look at a little bit more closely later. Also, you see an organ back there. This organ is uh, a magnificent organ, which was installed in 1999. It's a Turner organ. And we have uh, wonderful concerts here, some of the finest organists in the area and beyond have been here, including organists from Notre Dame. And uh, they often remark on how beautiful it is and how beautiful it sounds. It has over 3,000 pipes ranging in size from the diameter of a half an inch to a foot and uh, 12 feet long. And here we can see, uh, looking towards the front of the church, our beautiful altar. And um, if you look above the altar, you'll see another uh, stained glass window we'll talk about later. And of course, the image of Christ on the cross. So uh, St. Anne's is built as an American version of the Gothic style. So uh, for those of you who know about uh, architecture, um, the Gothic style is a type of uh, structure that was built in the, in the 12th century. And uh, some major advances were made uh, to really improve uh, the experience of being in a church. Uh, what was done, there were two um, major advances. One was the incorporation of flying buttresses. And flying buttresses are um, structures that are attached to the outside walls of the church that extend out and meet the ground. What that does, it takes some of the weight of the ceiling off of the walls. And the second thing that is done, uh, which we'll see in a moment here, are, in the ceiling are these spines. So here we are, have a shot of these spines which uh, in the Gothic style, uh, these are actually ornamental, but in the structure of the church in the Gothic style, these took again some of the weight off the roof ceiling and brought it down to these pillars into the, into the ground. What this allowed to happen was that this took uh, again the weight of the ceiling off and allowed the walls to be opened up. So instead of the walls having to be really thick made of stone, they were still made of stone, but they were allowed to have openings in them. So because they had openings in them, what could happen is that uh, windows could be placed to let in light. So it lightened up uh, the inside of the church. And also it allowed artisans to make stained glass windows. And we can see them here. Yeah. So um, stained glass windows, besides letting light into the church, they were a means of people to get education about their faith. Of course, when uh, we're talking about when the Gothic style first came out, many people were not literate. So the images seen on the windows were a graphic representation of the faith. They could see the saints, they could see uh, images of Christ and Mary, and it told in pictorial form the, uh, the history of the church and the history of their faith. So let's uh, take a little look now at some of our images of its stained glass windows.
Well, we won't go over each window. Uh, that would be a very long tour. But this uh, represents a typical layout of our windows. So here you can see um, at the very top of this set of windows, we can see what's called an oculus or an eye window. Um, that is representing a hand pointing down towards the authors of the gospel. This is representing one of the, one of the uh, members of the Trinity, which is God. Of course, there's uh, God, uh, Jesus, and uh, the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that hand represents the hand of God pointing down and giving authority to the writers of the gospel. Below, directly below that, you can see images of angels. And throughout the stained glass windows in St. Anne's, um, the um, pattern is there are angels on the top level of the windows, followed by saints and martyrs. And then at the very lower level of the windows uh, are images of what's called the, uh, all things called to praise. So uh, angels um, were, comes from the Greek uh, and it means a messenger. And they were considered to be messengers of uh, God to earth. And um, there were considered to be ranks of angels according to their uh, powers. Below them in this set of windows, we can see the gospel writers, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they are holding in their hands uh, representations or symbols of, of them. Um, and it, we will see later on that the various saints and martyrs are holding representations of um, things that they did in their lives or sometimes representing how they were martyred. Okay. So let's get that uh, lamp, the lamp up there, yeah. I don't know if you can zoom in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 This oculus or eye window uh, above the cross is the second person in the Trinity, which is the Lamb of God. And you can see here uh, the Lamb is representing Jesus, and his four hooves are on the book of Revelation. Uh, yeah, and catch some of the windows if you can, too. We probably can. Yep. Okay. Okay, here's a shot of a beautiful window showing um, for the apostles. We have James, Peter, Paul, and Andrew. And above them, we see the third uh, representation of the person of the Trinity, and this is the Holy Spirit. Here it's depicted as a dove descending upon them and bringing uh, the word of God to them. I'll bring your attention to Peter holding, uh, you can see him second from the left, holding the keys, representing the keys to the kingdom. And Paul next to him is holding a sword, which is the spiritus gladius or the sword of the spirit. So maybe we'll go to uh, over here. Let's see, we got, we'll get Polycarp here. Here's another set of windows. I want to draw your attention to the image of Polycarp, St. Polycarp on the left. Polycarp was an early church father that is a, an early uh, person who was uh, an, a, father, a follower of one of the apostles. And you can see he's holding in his hands some uh, wood which is, has flames coming out of it. So Polycarp was um, killed by being martyred 
and the way he was martyred was to be uh, killed over flames. So often in the images of, of our windows, we'll see uh, images again of how they might have been martyred or things they were famous for. Uh, now I'll bring your attention to the one on the right, which is Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas was a, was a scholar and one of the more important doctors of the church. They're called very important people in the church. And you can see uh, by his ear, you see a representation of the Holy Spirit as a dove, kind of giving him um, the inspiration to do his uh, writings. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, it'll be okay. Okay, good. Okay. Now, uh, at the bottom of this set of windows, we can see three images. There are uh, fountains and creatures of the sea and whales. So um, these refer to a passage in Daniel, which is uh, all things called to praise. And in this passage, uh, there are three men Mesach, Sadrach, and Abednego, who were um, captured Jews and were put to work for Nebuchadnezzar. And when they refused to worship the God they had made, the idol, God idol, uh, he, they were put into a furnace, but they were not consumed by the flames. Instead, they were uh, walking around within the flames, praising God, talking about mountains and streams and rivers and so all the things they talked about are represented in these lower panels of glasses of uh, windows called all things called to praise and they're quite beautiful uh, let's see now okay okay so uh let's go up to the yuma street side and see one of our beautiful works of art the pieta So, here we have Michelangelo's Pieta. Of course, this isn't the Pieta, but it practically is the Pieta. Uh, that's because um, during World War II, the Vatican had uh, images, um, the, the important images, statues uh, cast. Actually, they had molds made of them so they could be cast in the future. The reason they did this was that because they were concerned that um, they might be destroyed or stolen during the war. So these molds, uh, luckily they, they weren't, <laughs> but these molds were saved. And afterwards, the Vatican authorized a company to make representations, exact representations of some of their artwork. And so this is actually not just somebody reproducing it by uh, off their, uh, an image or something. This is an actual mold of the Pieta, so it's a, an exactly the correct size. The process um, is done by uh, casting within the mold a combination of Carrera marble. Of course, the original Pieta is made of Carrera marble and uh, proprietary other substances which are made to harden and then uh, they're hand finished. It takes about two and a half months to finish these by hand, and then they're polished. So St. Anne's was, there were only a hundred of these in the world, and St. Anne's was lucky enough to be uh, authorized to have uh, one of these. So Michelangelo uh, created this for a cardinal for his, for his funerary statuary, <laughs> and uh, he was told to make the most beautiful statue unsurpassed uh, in Rome. And actually, many people think this is Michelangelo's greatest uh, production of a, of a piece, a statue. And um, so um, one day Michelangelo uh, was in the presence of the statue, which was finished, and there were people observing it. And they were saying, I wonder who did the statue. Maybe there was so-and-so in Milan. Or it's a, and he got kind of angry. So that night, he made his way into the place where it was stored, 
and being showed. And across the sash of Mary, he chiseled in, this was done by, Michael, by Michelangelo. So um, he eventually felt kind of bad about that, but this is the only piece of uh, art that Michelangelo actually signed. Uh, another interesting fact is that the, um, the original Pieta was brought to the United States for the 1964 New York World's Fair, where it was seen by over 20 million people. And the way that was done was that the statue was, uh, was shown and there was a, an actual conveyor belt. There were so many people who wanted to see it. There was a conveyor belt where it, which would move slowly in front of the, of the statue. Of course, if you come to St. Anne's, there's no conveyor belt needed. You can just come on in and take a look. Okay, so let's take a walk out the Yuma Street door here and take a look at some of the architecture of St. Anne and also talk about some of our history. See here. That building over there you may have seen is used to be the Immaculata School, which was a Catholic religious school for young women. If you ever wondered, now it's owned by. American University Law School. If you get a shot of that right over there, that's the cornerstone. Okay. You may want to get a little closer. So we could see right over here beyond this fence and that stone carved, and that's actually the cornerstone of St. Anne. So traditionally what is done is the cornerstone is placed uh, and the church is built and then eventually uh, later on the church is dedicated. Inside that cornerstone are some objects from the year 1947 and 48, which is when this church was uh, dedicated. You may want to get a close-up of that so you can read it. Here's a plaque showing when our church is dedicated. And as you can see, this parish is established soon after the Civil War in 1869. Okay. On the front of the edifice of St. Anne's Church, you can see St. Anne represented as a statue. And below her are our door, doorways. And we can see some representation, some iconography representing our faith. We can see a fish associated often with Christ when he told people he would be the fisher of men, told Peter he would be the fisher of men. The hand representing the hand of God and the dove representing the Holy Spirit. On either side you can see the letters in Greek of Alpha and Omega, meaning the beginning, 
and the end. Because we'll, we'll come back to this. The building we're looking at here is currently being used as our gymnasium, but this was uh, built in the late 30s, 1937, 38, when the church needed to expand. However, originally this was the site of the first St. Anne's Church. So on this site, was built the first St. First Anne's Church in the late 1860s, 67, 68. It was a, uh, a building that held approximately 100 parishioners. So the way St. Anne's was founded was that you have to uh, think back in time, this whole area, though quite busy with cars now, originally was farmland. But something happened in the late, in the mid uh, 1860s, and that was the Civil War. And when that happened, Fort Reno, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with, was established by the Union Army, and there was a great influx of people into this area. And into the area came um, merchants, etc. so the area started to develop. But there were some families who were located here, and, um, and some Catholics, there were about 100 Catholics at that point in this immediate area. So in order for them to receive the sacraments and go to church, they had to go to Trinity Church down in Georgetown, where originally uh, Wisconsin Avenue was called the uh, Georgetown Rockville Pike, Turnpike, and it was a uh, rough road. So it was a quite a long ride for people to go to church at Trinity. So a woman um, named Ann Green was a devout Catholic, and she lobbied to have a parish established in this location. So the name uh, of our church, St. Anne, is of course named after St. Anne, but also as a nod to Anne Green, who uh, through her, her dedication and her efforts, we now have St. Anne's Parish. Okay, so let's walk a bit this way and we can see the next location uh, where our church was. For many years, St. Anne had an academy, um, but uh, recently, uh, due to uh, circumstances, it was closed, and now it is being used by St. Albans as a child development center. So I think we should go up and then in front of that statue. Sure. Yep. How are you doing, okay? Are your arms getting tired?
Okay. I'm standing in front of the statue of St. Anne and her daughter, Mary. And actually, this is the site of the second St. Anne Church, which was built in the early 1900s, 1902. It had a capacity to seat about 300 parishioners. It was larger, and it was an indication that the Catholic community in St. Anne was, was growing. Okay, so let's walk through the side door of the church. As you can see on our grounds, we have this wonderful playground, which is being used by kids, and it's a wonderful resource. Come on in. So we hope this brief tour has given you an idea of St. Anne's, the building, and a little bit about our history. Um, but I think a point we should make is that uh, the St. Anne community is more than a building. It's more than our, our history. Uh, we're very active today in, our, in the Tenley Town community. We support uh, Friendship Place, plus numerous other activities. Uh, it's a place where people can come and have some time uh, to be among other people and also to some quiet time. These days are a lot going on. Have some quiet time and to reflect on their lives. Um, it's a source of strength for many people and solace. And uh, we invite you, uh, if you're interested in come by and taking a look at our church when you can. And also uh, we have a wonderful website you can explore at standc.org, I believe. And um, take a look there. There are a lot of great pictures and uh, tells you what kind of activities we have, also our bulletins. So thanks for taking part in this Winterfest. We appreciate it.